Hello, everyone. Welcome to the Mindscape Podcast. I'm your host, Sean Carroll. So we've just been through an eventful launch week for the book version of The Biggest Ideas in the Universe, Volume 1 on Space, Time, and Motion. That was fun. Gave a bunch of talks. And we had the podcast last week, the solo podcast, which highlighted one of the ideas from The Biggest Ideas, which was Einstein's equation for general relativity, the equation relating space-time and how it curves to matter and energy things like that. And the payoff of that equation is that you discover the existence of black holes. Basically, neither Einstein nor even Schwarzschild, who went off and sol solved Einstein's equation immediately after Einstein came up with it, neither one of them knew that they would, were predicting black holes. They went to their graves, as it were, not knowing that black holes were predicted by general relativity. Of course, things changed. You know, Einstein died in the 1950s. In the late 50s and 60s, scientists really began to understand what black holes are. These days, as it turns out, we observe them. Not directly, of course, they're black. We can't actually see them give off radiation. But we absolutely know they're there because we can see what effects they have on the universe around them. We can image the matter giving off radiation near the center of our galaxy and other galaxies. We can get gravitational waves from two different black holes in spiraling toward each other. And of course, there's been indirect evidence for a long time from X-rays and quasars and things like that. So basically, we're moving into an era of black hole astronomy where we don't just think about black holes, but we observe them using many different techniques and use what we learn from those observations to better understand the whole evolution of the universe. With that in mind, we're very happy today to have Chiara Mingarelli on the podcast. Chiara is a astrophysicist, physicist slash astronomer, I guess, who thinks about black holes and how to detect them. Now, the great thing is that the way that she specializes in detecting black holes is not one of the usual ways. Kiara is an expert in what are called pulsar timing arrays. And this is just a, just a fun idea. It's one you'd be rooting for to work out, even if you didn't know anything about how sensitive and, and important it's going to be. Pulsar timing arrays basically come from the fact that Black holes and other things, by the way, emit gravitational waves. So it's really what we're looking for is not the black holes directly, but gravitational waves emitted by black holes and maybe some sort of background other gravitational waves from other sources. But black holes are probably black holes doing things, spiraling in, you know, uh, swallowing up matter. Those are the biggest sources of gravitational waves out there. And what happens is these gravitational waves pass by pulsars, which are very tiny neutron stars rapidly spinning, and these pulsars turn out to be really, really good clocks. They emit their beams of light in very, very regular pulses. So if you have a big, long gravitational wave that passes by all the pulsars in our galaxy that we're monitoring, it will slightly distort the timing of those signals that we get from the pulsars. And you can figure out what kind of gravitational wave it is. So basically, you're using a bunch of stars scattered through the galaxy as a gravitational wave detector, which is not only a surprisingly good way to detect gravitational waves, it's a completely different wavelength range than we can look at here on Earth. So it's a different kind of physics underlying what we will ultimately see. We don't know, as we'll learn in Kiara's podcast, we don't actually have a claimed detection that we know for sure that the pulsars have seen gravitational waves, but we seem to be very, very close. It's very, very tantalizing. So we're going to learn something about it, hopefully, in the near future. And we get to talk about, you know, black holes more generally. Could they be the dark matter? What did LIGO find? What does it all mean? Once again, a reminder that unlike myself, who is a theoretical astrophysicist and likes to write down equations, most physicists out there are actually looking at data, collecting information. Chiara, by the way, is also a theoretical physicist, but she works very, very closely in the team that is looking at the data from pulsar timing. And so it's a it's a real sort of honest combination of theoretical work and good old observational work. That's how we learn about the universe. So that's why you're at the right place. Let's go. Yara Mingarelli, welcome to the Mindscape Podcast. Thank you. It's great to be here. 
We talked about black holes before in the podcast and even gravitational waves, but there's never enough talk about black holes. So I agree. I, I always like to ask the black hole oriented guests, you know, how do you define a black hole? What do you think about? It'll be different for a quantum gravity person than an astro- astronomer, I, I presume. Yeah. So that's a great question. When I think about black holes, I think about water coming out of a water fountain. Okay. And I think about the water going up and then falling back in itself. And that a black hole is going to be some sort of ultra compact object, although formally, mathematically, it's a singularity, this point of infinite curvature of space time, whatever that means. Right. I, you know, in my mind's eye and in my heart, I feel like a black hole is actually a thing. It's probably a very small thing. But oh, wait, so what is the analogy? Why is it a fountain? So it's like the, the light coming out of the black hole, whatever that is. Like if you look inside the event horizon of the black hole, if you could imagine being inside on the other side, hmm. you would probably see light coming out and being processed around the singularity, like water coming out of a water fountain, going up and then falling back down okay. because the water itself can't ever escape. So it might make a spray. It might kind of get close and then start doing weird and wonderful wiggles but it's never going to just take off and go away. It's going to be like water going up and then coming back down in on itself. So this is so that's the view from inside the event horizon. That's right. Well, we're not going to get because we're astronomers now today. For yeah. today's episode, we're looking at the outside <laughs> of the black hole, right? Yes. And, you know, we've we've come a long way. Like, I, I don't know how how has our thought about black holes empirically, like in the universe, yeah. changed since you started thinking about these things professionally? Right. Let's see. So when I was starting to think about black holes when I was a kid, right, I would save my babysitting money to buy Scientific American magazines. (laughs) And I would take all the glossy photos and put them on my wall next to Jonathan Taylor Thomas and Jonathan Brandis. Classic. You didn't. Well, (laughs) my my friends didn't. But, you know, I I had a few friends. Um, And so the black holes were just kind of like this. They were considered very theoretical. Right. There was sort of evidence from Cygnus X1. There was, you know, X-rays that were coming out of this compact source. And it could have been a black hole accreting something. So gaining material from a star around it. And then like that material getting hot and ionized gas coming off of it, emitting X-rays. Maybe that's what was going on. But it was still very kind of fringe to talk about black holes. And I feel like today it's very concrete Uh, if you want to say. So now we have evidence of black holes merging. We have waveforms from ripples in the fabric of space time that they make, which is incredible. We have images of supermassive black holes of two of them that have been directly imaged, which is absolutely amazing. So I feel like black holes have gone from something that's very almost science fiction-y to something that's very hard science. And just to be clear, because I think that a lot of us are a little too quick when we talk about imaging or observing black holes. We're never seeing light coming from the black hole, right? We're seeing light coming from things around it and we're interpreting it. That's right. Absolutely. So we see light normally coming from an accretion disk around the black hole. So material that's, you know, kind of in an orbit around the black hole with it. And sometimes it feeds the black hole and sometimes it doesn't. And sometimes that material can Um, be part of jets that the black hole can make, can launch the jets. And some people say that those come from the black hole. But you're absolutely right, Sean, that a lot of people get confused by the terminology and think that the light is coming out of the black hole. It is not. Right. It's close to the black hole, but well, it's not people have probably out. heard of the idea of Hawking radiation, but right. nothing that you're doing has anything to do with Hawking radiation. We're never going to see Hawking radiation from the black holes that you care about. No, that's right. Yeah, Hawking radiation... Um, is not something that we care about right now. Maybe, you know, when Boltzmann brains. <laughs> <laughs> That's going to take a while. Yeah. Waking up and looking around, there might be some evaporating supermassive black holes. Did you see that holes. episode of Star Trek? The With most the... recent episode of Star Trek, no. uh, Strange New Worlds, had a Boltzmann brain. <gasps> yeah. You must have been delighted. No, they got it completely wrong. I mean, it's a great <laughs> show. I love the show. But this was like a godlike Boltzmann brain. That's really just not probably... I mean, it could be. I don't know. Anything is possible. Maybe if you wait long enough. <laughs> I don't think that was the simplest conclusion for them to leap to, that it was a Boltzmann brain. But <laughs> anyway, so the people were weirdly for a long time, sort of in the 20th century, skeptical that there were black holes. Like, yeah. I think that I, my childhood, 
cutting out pictures of black holes phase was in the 70s. And we already knew about Cygnus X1. Yeah. This was the famous one. But we didn't even know for sure that that was a black hole. And people were really, they, I guess they were properly cautious. But it was weird because they weren't sure whether they could be made. And in fact, it's just not that hard. I mean, nature wants to make black holes. Is that mm -hmm. safe to say? Yes, I think that nature makes black holes in lots of different ways, right? And, you know, if we think about the history of black holes, how they're these, you know, I don't know what to what to call them in, in layman's terms, but if you just think of them as like these, you know, weird singular points mm -hmm. in Einstein's equation. So they're the points where the equations can blow up. And so no one thought it was actually real, that maybe it's right. just some sort of artifact, like maybe we didn't write things down carefully enough, or maybe we made an assumption that we shouldn't have. And, you know, is it really possible to have something that's like a black hole? And so I understand why people were skeptical because, you know, as scientists, sometimes we make a lot of approximations yeah. <laughs> and sometimes it's fine and sometimes it's not fine. And so I understand people being careful. Um, but then going back to these, you know, Einstein equations, what boggles my mind right now is that if one of the solutions allows black holes, that means that the other one would allow white holes. That's and true. What does that mean? <laughs> How can Don't we ask believe? That, we could talk about that, but that'd be a very different episode than what okay. we have coming up. This is yeah. So this this boggles my mind right now. Like, how can I believe one and then the other one doesn't make any sense? The arrow of time. That's the answer. But okay. That is, you should interview did, me for did your you, podcast. Do you know about that, Sean? I do know a little bit about that. Yes. <laughs> did you write a book on that, Sean? But you've already you've mentioned that there's different populations of yes. black holes, right? Yes. So there are ways that nature makes them, but there are different ways. So like what. We have, again, a lot of recent new data and yeah. discoveries, but before that, yeah. what was our expectation for what the populations of black holes would be like? Right. So that's a fully loaded question. So maybe I'll start with how nature makes black holes and how nature seems to want to make black holes. So if we start with the very small end, potentially primordial black holes. Mm -hmm. So there were potentially at the beginning of the universe, these small fluctuations and some of them could have been dense enough to create baby black holes. And so those were never stars. Like there might not have ever even been any matter or baryons that went into creating those black holes. That it's just a kind of blemish in the right. curvature of space time. Like that kind of black hole is all curvature, which is so strange to think about. <laughs> but it's entirely possible. Then there's the black hole. And also, you, by the way... Yeah. Zero evidence that that actually happens. Yes. But it's something we can think about. Exactly. And they could even maybe be the dark matter. Who knows? Yeah. Well, exactly. It could possibly be because you could possibly get some of them that are as massive as the LIGO sources. Right. And so the first detection from LIGO was to roughly 30 solar mass black holes. And some people think that those could be primordial black holes. Those could have come from the early universe. Um, and maybe those are also dark matter. Like maybe that's the missing matter in the universe. Who knows? Right now it feels like that parameter space is being squeezed yeah. pretty hard, that it's very unlikely that that's the answer. But right. it's curious. Well, black holes exist yes. and they're black, so that's, yes. that's good. But it is hard to make the right number of them to be the dark matter is my impression. Exactly. And there's a lot of things that you would have to discount, like the lack of lensing events. Oh, right? okay. That, Sorry. Yeah. Say more about that. Well, that... Um, you know, if if you have black holes, you can have light that's behind them that gets lensed when they're traveling on the way to Earth. And if you were to have so many black holes that they were the dark matter, they would create a lot of these lensing events. And there's no evidence for this Got at it. all. So I feel like it's being squeezed in a lot of different ways, that there's a lack of evidence and a lot of different fronts for these black holes to be the dark matter. So there still could be primordial black holes, but maybe not enough to be the dark matter. Yeah, or maybe not enough that are in that mass range, Okay. right? It's possible that, I mean, there's there's a lot of theories about different masses of black holes that you can make depending on the conditions that you had in the early universe um, and what you believe. But right now, the LIGO mass black holes, anything from like 10 to 100 solar masses, that's really hard right now to get those to explain dark matter. Okay. So how do you make them? So they come from the collapse of stars, very massive stars at the end of their lives will undergo a gravitational collapse and um, the remnant will be either a neutron star or a black hole. So the neutron star is kind of a halfway phase. It's a halt that happens when you have the electrons and the protons that come together and make a neutron. 
there's not enough pressure to make the neutrons to continue to collapse. There's a, a neutron degeneracy pressure. <laughs> That's okay. You can <laughs> use those words and we can assume people know what it means. But anyway, neutrons. Basically, the neutrons, you need a lot of pressure right. to get them to, you know, co continue to collapsing into a black hole to make whatever material is at the center, whatever quantum description you have of that, whatever your equation of state of that fluid or material or whatever quark gluon plasma you think makes up the central object inside a black hole it takes a lot of pressure to get the neutrons to make, to turn into that kind of material. So some of them just stop there and they're about one and a half to two times the mass of the sun. But if you can keep going, then you right. create black holes. And then the cool thing is that from black holes that are, you know, one or 10 or a hundred solar masses, they can merge. And the final mass is the sum of the two black holes minus 5% for gravitational waves. Okay. So we're making... If it's if the thing that is collapsing weighs roughly less than the sun, it'll be a white dwarf or a neutron star. If it's enough bigger, it'll make a black hole. Yeah. Okay. So That's we expect right. to have a bunch of black holes that are more than one solar mass. Yes. And then if they merge, they can get up there. Exactly. But the fun thing, I think, yeah. is that there hasn't been enough time in the history of the universe to merge all the stellar mass black holes that are roughly the size of the mass of the sun to make a supermassive black hole. Okay, what are those? So supermassive black holes are around 100,000 to a million and potentially up to 10 billion times the mass of the sun. They are the biggest black holes in the universe. No one knows how those black holes were made. There's, a, of course, a bunch of different formation channels that you can imagine. One is that you had these huge gas clouds in the beginning of the universe that just directly collapsed into a black hole. Okay. But that's hard because it means that none of that gas was heated, none of it fragmented right. to form stars, that it just kind of went shoop and then created a supermassive black hole and there you go. So that's kind of mind boggling. But there's an intermediate uh, kind of theory where you have the gas cloud and then it collapses and it makes these huge stars that live fast and die young and they make kind of intermediate mass black holes. So maybe 10,000 solar masses, 1,000 solar masses. And those all quickly merge to make okay. a supermassive black hole. How would we know? Is this something we're trying to discover with telescopes? I'm so glad you asked <laughs> that. Yes. So one of the ways that we can find out what the um, what we call them seeds, supermassive black hole seeds are, is by looking at gravitational wave signatures from the early universe. Because if you do have all of these merging uh, intermediate mass black holes that are you know building up to create a supermassive black hole each merger will emit a gravitational wave signature. And so um, the laser interferometer space antenna, or LISA, between friends, is going to launch in 2034. And that is going to be a huge LIGO-type instrument in space. And that will be able to detect um, those kinds of gravitational waves. Okay. Okay. We will be able to... All right. That's... This gets in. It's interesting how many things come together at once, right? We need to talk about the astronomy of making these things and then the physics of detecting them and, yeah. and so forth. But maybe tell me just a little bit more about the nature of these supermassive black holes because they're not rare, right? There's a lot of them. So there's um, at least one supermassive black hole in the center of every massive galaxy. And um, my own research is studying supermassive black hole mergers. So when galaxies merge and we have lots of snapshots of merging galaxies, in fact, um, the JWST image, uh, that came out earlier this week had, uh, Stefan's Quintet. Stefan's Quintet. It yes. was breathtaking. Five galaxies. Yeah. Five galaxies getting close and two that were actually merging. So we know that galaxies merge and it's also how we just think the universe works. There's this hierarchy and, you know, galaxies get bigger by merging with other galaxies. And so if that's true, then their central supermassive black holes should also merge. And those create the strongest gravitational waves in the universe. In fact, they're about a million times stronger than the ones that have already been detected at high frequencies. So maybe to explain this a little bit, because the black holes, like, let, me, let me ask it this way. Yeah. We use the words supermassive black holes, and they're the center of galaxies. Yeah. And I bet that in a lot of people's minds, the black holes are holding the galaxies together. Right. But they're not. They are not. They are a significant fraction of the mass, well, significant, maybe 1%, around 1% of the mass of the galaxy. Um, but 
you know, it, it's interesting that you say that it's actually also an open question. How did the supermassive black holes get to the centers of galaxies? Right. Uh, was was it that there was a galaxy that formed, a supermassive black hole formed somewhere else, and they found each other in the early universe? Is that how they were seeded, mm. we say? Um, were they formed in situ? That seems really hard to do. So that's another open problem. How big is a supermassive black hole? How like how many light years is the is the black hole at the center of our own galaxy? Do you know? So let's see. So we have a fun trick. Okay. Uh, the rel relativist units is to use seconds for everything, which is light seconds. <laughs> so one solar mass is 4.9 times 10 to the minus six seconds. Okay. So that's how long it would take light to traverse the sun. And so in the center of our galaxy, we have something that's about 4 million solar masses. So it would take maybe 10 seconds at most for light to get across the center. Ten light seconds. Ten, yeah, exactly. If you're a photon, okay. it'll take you less less than that. So four times, yeah. But what I'm asking is that's very tiny compared to the size of a galaxy, right? I mean, the even if it's 1% of the mass or, or less, yeah. it's much, much, much less than 1% of the size because black holes are very massive. So yeah. how do the two supermassive black holes find each other when two galaxies merge? Why, why do black holes merge at all? Right. So... That's a great question, and it's also an active area of research. There's very little known about the lives of supermassive black holes, mm. mostly because it takes so long for anything to happen on cosmological timescales. So I've done a few calculations which show that supermassive black holes will merge in something like two or three billion years. Okay. But that's a sizable a fraction of the age of the universe, <laughs> which is about, yeah. you know, 13 to 14 billion years old. So... Um, what happens, we think, is that your two galaxies um, interact gravitationally, their galaxies start to merge, and then it takes a while, but the black holes are eventually slowed down in the merger process by interacting gravitationally with gas and stars. And so okay. the technical term for this, uh, for experts that might be listening, is dynamical friction. Yep. And the black holes will then settle in the in the gravitational center of this newly formed galaxy. Um, but unless they're interacted upon by other forces, they can stay there forever, basically in a stable orbit. It'll take many times the age of the universe for these supermassive black holes to merge by only emitting gravitational waves. And so they can get to within about a light year uh, separation, but they will not merge unless something else acts on them. I see. So it's easy. Let me just repeat it to see yeah. if I got it right. So yeah. it's easy to see why black holes would sort of sink toward the neighborhood of the center yeah. because there's friction. Yeah. Right. Exactly. But they have, because they are so tiny, astrophysically speaking, they have to get really close and we don't know how they do that. Well, we have a few ideas on how they do that. And so this is called the final parsec problem for anyone who wants okay. to read about it. Yeah. Um, and so the black holes, the solution to this merger problem is that you realize that the black holes are not alone, right? That there is gas and there are still stars. And so if you have um, some stars that are crossing the orbit of the supermassive black hole, you know, pair, mm -hmm. every time that a star interacts with those two black holes, it'll carry away some energy and angular right. momentum. And so every time a star gets slingshot out and interacts with the black hole's orbit in that way, you get a little bit less mass and so energy that's in the system and it slingshots it out. If you have this happen enough times, then you can get the black holes close enough such that they merge within the age of the universe. Uh, you can also have a gas disk that develops around the two black holes and the gas can torque the black holes and make them merge in that sense. In nature, it's probably a combination of the two. Yeah, okay. Yeah. But to add a fun, you know, breaking news headline to this, uh -huh. some theorists have found in large hydrodynamical simulations that the gas disks can apply positive torques, which means that the black holes get further away from each ah. other <laughs> instead of negative torques, which make them merge. And apparently it really depends on um, the properties of the gas disk around them. So we think that for realistic disks, they probably merge. Mm. 
but, but you can make them not merge yeah, okay. <laughs> on a supercomputer. So it's all of these different competing effects. But if you can get the black holes to within a thousandth of a light year, then they do merge by emitting gravitational waves quite rapidly. So 25 million years with respect That's to nothing. the 2 billion years yeah. that it took them to get to the center of the galaxy. So the, really the last part is just noise. Well, this is really fun because it is a glimpse into you know where the frontier of astrophysics is these days, right? Like we know these supermassive black holes are there. We don't know exactly why, but we're also not just stuck speculating, right? We have some combinations of simulations and, and telescope measurements that will help us figure this out. That's right. That's right. And we, if we find gravitational waves from supermassive black holes, then we know for sure that they've overcome this final parsec problem. And then the question becomes, well, how did they do that? I see. Because we don't know. I mean, in some sense, they did overcome the problem because they exist, right? Yes. The supermassive black holes exist. Yes. And, uh, but we don't know whether they were made directly or they were assembled gradually and all these things. Gravitational waves will help us sort out. Yeah. So as you're saying, it'll help us sort out the formation scenario of the supermassive black holes. But even um, today, like if you had a merging pair of supermassive black holes, you'd know that they had to overcome this final parsec problem that comes from galaxy mergers. Got it. So the first gravitational wave story was at the, about the formation of supermassive black holes. And then the second story is now it's much Emerging. later in the history of the universe. Now they've there's black holes in the centers of galaxies. The galaxies are merging. What do the supermassive black holes do? And it's an interesting reminder that the universe is still kind of young. It's like still evolving, right? When that picture came out of Stefan's Quintet, the, there's, it's five galaxies interacting with each other. I think that probably people see pictures of galaxies and figure that's more or less a steady state kind of configuration. But it's really not. These galaxies are moving and bumping into each other and tearing each other apart. Absolutely. Yeah. And their black holes are merging. Hopefully there's stars being slingshot around. There's gas being funneled to the center. There's everything is very dynamic, but the time scale is not a human time scale. Yeah. And so we see it as being static, basically. <laughs> right. But if you just hit fast forward, you'll see, you know, really beautiful physics happening. And that's one of the, some of the power of the supercomputer simulations that you can speed up mergers and then actually try to get snapshots of galaxies that you see today in different parts of the merger process to be like, does this fit? Like, have I seen this part of the merger in space? And then you kind of look at pictures of space and you're like, oh yeah, oh, yeah. there's that galaxy there. So you're using pictures of different galaxies at different stages of their life as a proxy for the trajectory or history of a single thing. Yeah. Exactly. Because yeah. that's all that we've got, right? Yeah. Yeah, we're not going to wait around for a billion years to watch what happens, right? No, no, no. So we kind of knew or we had strong feelings that these supermassive black holes existed long before any of this gravitational wave stuff came that's along. That's right, yeah. Right? And is that – I honestly don't know the answer to this. I presume that's because we knew that there were quasars and things like that and we're just trying to explain them. So that's part of the picture, absolutely. But there's also the center of the Milky Way. Hmm. Right. And so there, uh, Andrea Ghez and her group at UCLA have very famously measured the mass of the black hole at the center of the Milky Way. And um, that's Sagittarius A star, which was recently imaged with the Event Horizon Telescope. And so by watching stars orbit around this central compact object without giving it a name, um, they could figure out what the mass was just by doing some very simple Kepler's laws calculations. So if you know um, the mass of the star, and then you know roughly what its orbit is, and you can watch several orbital periods, you can get a really good handle on what the mass of the central object it's orbiting is. And we don't see a lot of photons coming from the center of our galaxy, right? It's a pretty quiet black hole. Right now, it's a pretty quiet black hole. Um, there is evidence, though, that there at one point in its history had some jets. Okay. There's some gas that people have been able to see, which would indicate that at one point there were jets coming from Sagittarius A star. But this is very speculative, right? We, we can only say, like, this is consistent with the existence of jets at some point in the past. But you can't rewind the universe to check. But we do see that distant galaxies are often, like, very bright. That's what a quasar is, right? It's, it's a tiny speck in space that is giving off way too much light. And eventually we realized it was sort of a jet being beamed right toward us from a black hole. That's right. From a supermassive black hole. From a supermassive black hole. That's right. Yeah. And so those were all over the place in the earlier universe. And now we're entering our adulthood and we don't have as many quasars. That's right. Yeah. 
yeah. <laughs> and it does, yeah, yeah. The universe is, is, is changing a little bit. And so it's at least a consistent story that our galaxy used to have a quasar. Yeah, right? yeah, that's right. And also, if you think about it, in the early universe, there was a lot more gas. And today there's a lot more stars, mm. right? That gas right. has become stars. And so even if you want to hearken back to the final parsec problem, it's possible that earlier on in the universe, it was solved through gas interactions, through these torques, and that today, for nearby emerging supermassive black holes, it's mainly stars. This uh, makes me ask a question, because I know we're going to get this question. What about the dark matter here? Because, you know, you're a grown-up astronomer, you know, there's dark matter in the universe more than there is ordinary matter. Does that play any role in making black holes, is it, or is it just irrelevant? It's a tough question. Um... There are different kinds of dark matter. There's not just one kind of dark matter. So one um, kind of dark matter that I think is very popular right now, because just like everything, there's different fashions and trends in uh, theoretical physics and astronomy. Um, but there's something called super radiance. Okay. And so what happens is that there's these particles which are created around the supermassive black holes. And the creation of this particular kind of dark matter-like particle, this axion, um, spins down the supermassive black hole. And so if you watch one long enough, you could actually see it spin spin down. So sorry, just to get this straight, this is because axions, the axion field exists in the universe, or is this literally because there are dark matter axions, if there are at all? Yeah. Axions are still hypothetical, but yeah. is it a bunch of, like a cloud of axions near the black hole or helping it radiate? Yes. Okay. The, yeah, there's a cloud of axions that are around the supermassive black hole. In fact, it happens around stellar mass black holes. It's just right. these clouds of axions can exist around black holes. And they can, in fact, I believe, emit gravitational <laughs> waves as well, kind of like a large okay, gravitational yeah. atom, where to go from one state to the other, they emit gravitational waves. If you can imagine that kind of funky gravitational so, atom system. <laughs> I can imagine it, but I'm certainly not an expert. But let's, let's, let's be kind to our listeners and explain a little bit about gravitational waves. Like yes. we've been using the terminology yes. and I'm sure that they've heard the terminology before, but let's try to explain what a gravitational wave is. When I say let's, I mean, could you do that, please? Of course. So gravitational waves are ripples in the fabric of space time that travel at the speed of light. And gravitational waves change the distances between objects. So you and I uh, are sitting... A little bit. A very little yeah. bit. <laughs> a very little bit. So, you know, by the fraction of the size of a proton for uh, a LIGO-style gravitational wave. So you and I are sitting at opposite ends of the room, for example. So we would still be standing in place, but we would get closer together and then further away and then closer together, and then further away without actually moving, because it's the space-time between us that's changing. And so with LIGO, um, the LIGO gravitational wave detector can detect gravitational waves that are at hundreds of hertz. And so if you could... Hertz yeah, per second. You, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> that's right. Just got to be, you know, I'm sure most people know what a hertz is, but just check. Yes, we have a very educated yes. uh, listening population. Um, and so you could actually hear those if your ears could hear gravitational waves. They would go Ooh, when they merge <laughs> and make that chirping sound. Um, and so it's, it makes sense to think about the change in distance over distance when you're thinking about those kinds of gravitational waves. And that's really how we think about the strength of a gravitational wave. The technical term is the strain but it's just how strong that gravitational wave is. How much does it okay. distort the fabric of space-time? So you can think about a change in distance over distance. And for LIGO, this is, you know, the fraction of a size of a proton over a few miles. The, and the miles are the distance the, between that the sort of LIGO laser is moving. Exactly. Okay. Exactly. And so that's the strain. But if you think about... So sorry, wait, yeah. let me just make sure I understand this. Because the point is that uh, there's this uniform stretching of space, almost uniform. But uh, what that means is the further away a laser moves before it bounces back, the more the distortion of space is. And the invariant thing is the distortion divided by the distance 
Exactly. That's distance divided by distance. That's what you mean by that. Exactly. Yeah. So it's this, that change in distance over distance is the strain. Got it. And that is something like the fraction of the size of a proton that the gravitational wave changed over a few miles. Right. Okay. Which is not very much. Crazy small. <laughs> exactly. The fact that they should that give a Nobel Prize to the people who did that. <laughs> they should. Absolutely. Absolutely. If we were time travelers, we could go back to 2017 and make sure that that happened. And so LIGO is the famous experiment that did win the Nobel Prize. Yeah. That's right. That's right. Um, and so changing the distance, you know, thinking about distance changes makes a lot of sense for LIGO in that sense, but there's other gravitational wave detectors. And the one that I work on is called the pulsar timing array, mm -hmm. but it's the same idea. You look for these space time distortions, but with a pulsar timing array, what you do is that you look at a series of pulsars. So a pulsar is a neutron star that we talked about earlier, but now its spin axis is misaligned with its magnetic field line. So every time it spins around, it sends a flash of radio waves to the earth, like a lighthouse. So you get these really stable flashes. So we know exactly when those flashes should arrive. So stable just means it's a good clock. It's an almost perfect clock. Before 2012, they were better than atomic clocks. Okay. Pulsars. Pulsars. Gotcha. Amazing. Very, um, for the experts, it's a millisecond pulsar. But if you're not an expert, pulsar is fine. <laughs> Just to just to be safe. So is millisecond a short period of time for a pulsar or a long period? It's very short. Okay. Yeah, it means that it spins around about 100 times a second. Okay. And just to blow your mind a little bit more, these millisecond pulsars are about one and a half times the mass of the sun. And they spin around 100 times a second and they would fit into the island of Manhattan. <laughs> it would be a bad idea, though. You don't it would want be that a to happen. We do not want that to happen. Okay. Absolutely not. But For like that's miles how small across. they are. They're very, exactly, they're very small. And 100 times a second. That's so right. Whenever I, I like it because whenever we say they're very small, you know, compared to what? They're, yeah. they're much smaller than the Earth, but they're more massive than the sun. Exactly, <laughs> exactly. But they are smaller than Manhattan. But the fact that they spin around 100 times a second is impressive. Right, And they exactly. don't fly apart because gravity is so strong. Right. That's right. How many of these do we know about? Oh, there. I mean, there are thousands of pulsars okay. um, that we know of. We There's potentially tens of thousands of them in the Milky Way galaxy alone. Currently, there's only about 100 of these pulsars that are good enough clocks mm -hmm. to look for gravitational waves. But I haven't yet told you how we use them as Please. gravitational wave detectors. Thank you. <laughs> Maybe I will. So, yes, the... The pulsars are perfect clocks, basically, for all intents and purposes. And so you measure their time of arrival of the pulse at the Earth. Mm -hmm. You know when it should arrive. You've measured when they do arrive. And any change in when the pulse arrives with respect to when it should arrive could indicate the fact that now that pulsar is sitting on the other side of the room and it got a little bit further away from me and it, right. then it gets a little bit closer. So the pulsar time arrivals will change a little bit. They could arrive early and then they can arrive late. And so now when we're thinking about the strain again, if you're thinking about a change in distance over distance, LIGO style, this is something like 10 meters per light year. Mm -hmm. But as humans, it doesn't really mean a lot. <laughs> it doesn't, mean a lot <laughs> right? it doesn't really mean a lot. And so it's, in my opinion, more intuitive to think about a change in time over time. Okay. And that is something like, 100 nanoseconds over a decade. Oh, okay. So small. A tiny exactly. Amount a change. tiny amount. But that change is still a million times stronger than the change that a stellar mass black hole merger will give you in the LIGO detectors. Okay, wait. Now I'm very confused now. Oh, but okay. let's, let's catch our breath. That's bad. So That's bad. What? So th the idea is that there are all these different ways of detecting gravitational waves. Yeah. But just like a telescope that... There are optical telescopes, infrared telescopes, X-ray telescopes, different wavelengths they're looking at. Likewise, the gravitational wave telescopes are only sensitive to certain wavelengths. That's right. Yes. And LIGO is sensitive to? Tens to hundreds of hertz. Hertz. And do you know how many meters or kilometers that corresponds to? <laughs> no, I don't know either. So, okay. They can <laughs> it's look also, it up. It's also complicated because 
um, that my experimentalist colleagues will be very proud of me of knowing that there are power recycling mirrors in the LIGO arms, oh, yes, which effectively true. makes the arms much longer than they actually are, which able, enables you to detect stronger signals from these black hole mergers. Right. Okay, good. So just to translate that, if, if, if detected, I understand it. The actual LIGO arms are about four kilometers in apart, or at least you know, in length. But what you're saying is that they can detect gravitational waves with wavelengths longer than that because they keep bouncing back and forth over and over again. Potentially, yeah. Yeah, okay, good. So yeah. what is relevant, I think you're right, what is relevant is the frequency in hertz, not the wavelength, really. The frequency is what we care about. Okay, so then say it again now that I'm listening. What was the, <laughs> what was the frequency for the LIGO? For LIGO, it's uh, tens to hundreds of hertz. Of hertz. Okay, so yeah. tens to hundreds of cycles per second. That's right. Whereas your pulsar timing arrays... Yes, are sensitive to 1 to 100 nanohertz. And a nano is... So 1 nanohertz is about um, 30 years. Like... One over 30 one years. over 30 years, yeah, right. Yeah, exactly. Right. So, so it, it would take 30 years for one full wave cycle to go by. And that roughly corresponds to the fact that we're looking to pulsars scattered throughout the galaxy that are light years away from us. Exactly. And okay. so there's no other way to detect that we know of right now these very low-frequency gravitational waves. Because now if you think about, well, for a few reasons, mainly... These, these gravitational waves that are coming from supermassive black holes are very low frequency or have these very long wavelengths. So something on Earth could never detect a gravitational wave that has a period of decades. Decades, right. You just can't do it. So the, so the LIGO detectors look at these in-spiraling black holes that were tens of solar masses. That's right. And that's just what they're sensitive to. I mean, yeah. there could be black holes out there that are single solar masses that are inspiraling or thousands of solar masses that are inspiraling and LIGO just wouldn't know. That's right. Yeah. Okay. And so we talked a little bit about the LISA detector earlier on when we were talking about supermassive black hole seeds. But mm -hmm. in fact, LISA is now sensitive to the millihertz frequency okay. regime, which is right in between LIGO and pulsar timing arrays. And so they would be able to detect these thousand solar mass black hole mergers. But again, like LIGO will not be able to detect that. And right. neither will pulsar timing arrays. But LISA is scheduled to be launched and you said 2034. Four, right now. And it's never going to happen, obviously. I mean, it will happen, but it's not going to happen in 2034 because no satellite has ever launched the year they plan to launch. It's interesting that you should say that because normally I would strongly agree with you, <laughs> like vehemently. Yeah. I would be in violent agreement with you. But there's some reasons that we might want to launch LISA earlier. So number one, there's always this Pathfinder mission. And LISA's Pathfinder mission was, it performed, you know, extraordinarily better it surpassed all expectations it was an amazing flight so the technology is ready to go there's a an x-ray telescope called athena which is supposed to be launched in 2028 okay and this x-ray telescope would be the perfect instrument to try to follow up on supermassive black hole mergers that lisa could see so if they were to launch at roughly the same time or at the very least be alive in space at the same time, you would have a huge science case for, you know, looking at these electromagnetic or like light signals from merging supermassive black holes. And there might not be another opportunity to do this in the near future. Got it. So there's a strong case that's being made right now to move up the LISA, Lisa. launch date so that it can coincide with Athena. Okay. And Lisa is the set of basically lasers in space. Bouncing lasers back and in forth. space, exactly. It's a it's called a constellation because there's three different points and it makes a triangle. And what's cool about this is that in this triangle, you can make two independent LIGO-like detectors. So you can take your equilateral triangle and make two independent right angle interferometers from it. Um, and that means that as your triangular configuration is circling the Earth and floating around, it can detect the polarization of your gravitational wave. Okay. And so this is exciting, not only for detecting polarization information itself, but because according to general relativity, there should only be two gravitational wave polarizations, which are plus and cross. So the plus configuration is when you and I are going, um, now let's just imagine a gravitational wave passing through our human body. You first are stretched up 
and you look like a supermodel yep. or very tall or <laughs> a, a modern supermodel, I should say, very tall, very thin. And then you get squished down and stretched out and then you look like a sumo wrestler right. and then you get stretched back up again. Now that's you can the plus. Exactly. That's the plus. So you can rotate that by 45 degrees and you get cross. Two polarizations. There's right. two polarizations. So just like light, but the, the specifics of how they're polarized are different, but light is either vertically or horizontally polarized, gravity waves, plus and cross. Plus and cross. That's if, the theory. If you, anyway. That's the, yes. Well, so exactly. But there's some alternative theories of gravity, which predict more polarization. So something like a breathing mode, and that would be um, like a circle kind of breathing out and then contracting back in on itself. So imagine a sphere getting bigger and then collapsing like a long breathing, but right. it's this circular polarization. Well, so the breathe, regular, it's not a circular polarization. Not, that I technically mean. means yeah. something else. I just mean it's like a, <laughs> a circle pattern a circle. that's breathing in and out. Well, what I guess the point is that the regular gravitational waves, they stretch in one direction, but also squeeze in the other. Yeah. And you're saying that these fancy non-general relativity hypothetical waves stretch in every direction and then squeeze in every That's direction. right. Yeah. Okay. But they don't exist on their own. It's an addition. It's like you have yeah. plus and cross and breathing. Right. Okay. And so and we got to there by saying that Lisa could potentially disentangle this. LIGO could potentially as well if you have enough interferometers and if you're lucky with the orientation of your mm. source because you'll always have this problem where you have um, more sensitivity to some polarizations than others by how your source, your gravitational wave source is facing the earth right. okay. because those gravitational waves and interact with your antennas and your antennas are going to be more or less sensitive um, to different orientations of your gravitational wave sources. So it sounds like so far, what like so we got to separate out what we've done from what we're hoping to do, right? Yes. I mean, LIGO has detected things. LIGO has detected things, absolutely, as unequivocally. <laughs> <laughs> Lisa has not detected anything yet because it hasn't does, flown yet. Exactly. Um, and we've not yet figured out the polarization of gravitational waves. So it seems like mostly what we have is consistent with our expectations, but it's hard to do detailed tests of general relativity. If general relativity were modified a little bit, it would still be consistent with what we've seen so far. Yeah, this, I mean, this is a really interesting point. There's lots of different modifications that you can make to general relativity. And so, so far, the polarization ones, um, there's no red flags, right. but you can also make modifications to the waveform. And those uh, can be very subtle and can, sometimes they're only, detectable in the in spiral part of okay. the gravitational wave signal. So before the whoop chirp at the end <laughs> of the life, you can get small changes that are happening in the in spiral when it's not chirping so much. But that part is really difficult to detect because it's very low frequency. And at low frequencies on Earth, you're dominated by, you know, things like clouds passing overhead oh, yeah. of your detector. We're very sensitive detectors. Newtonian so. noise. Uh, you know, you, you have earthquakes. You have trucks driving by. You have alligators that can crash <laughs> in. Because Louisiana your arm. has one of the uh, exactly. Yeah, detectors. Yeah. So there's a lot of things that can go wrong. So right now, a lot of the very low frequency information is lost in okay. that in that noise. But future detectors, like the Einstein telescope, which is being proposed. Um, or, uh, you know, that's another cosmic, gravitational wave. Yes. Or cosmic Explorer. These will all have very good low frequency noise capabilities. So the plan is to bury them underground oh, to do okay. a better job at controlling those kinds of noise sources. Okay. You did say earlier, speaking of predictions of general relativity, that the gravitational waves move at the speed of light. Yes. How do we know that? Well, if there's Do any justice in the universe, they should have, <laughs> <laughs> but there might not be. Have you been in the universe lately? Inside. There's not a lot of justice. <laughs> <gasps> Way to keep it real, Sean. Way to keep it real. <laughs> you are right. Uh, so there's only recently been a verification of this prediction that gravity travels at the speed of light by a binary neutron star merger that was seen. So not a black hole. It was not a black hole. It was two neutron stars that were merging with each other. And um, we saw the light and the gravitational wave signal from that system. And the light arrived two times 10 to the minus 15 seconds after the gravitational wave signal. <laughs> uh, so that's two parts in a million billion. Okay. So, so we almost know. Almost the same time. 
that for it's pretty good. Yeah. It's pretty it's pretty much the same time. So so when was, the black holes merge, we don't see anything with electromagnetic waves. Of course, everyone has a theory where you could possibly see something, but in in, in in very straight GR, there's no expectation of seeing an electromagnetic counterpart. In fact, it's one of the things when I first started studying gravitational waves that really blew my mind is that gravitational waves, it's another spectrum. It has mm. nothing to do with light. And, <laughs> I, <laughs> and it's, you know, people also call it gravitational radiation. That's another word that's used synonymously. Um, that took me a long time to understand as well that gravitational radiation is gravitational waves, but you can, it's much easier to think about electromagnetic radiation and gravitational radiation. They each have their own spectrum. They, but they're different. They're intrinsically different. Like you can have one source, like a light bulb, but that's emitting multiple frequencies, right? Multiple different wavelengths. You can look at it with an infrared camera. You can look at it with optical, with your eyes, but with a gravitational wave source, it's really going to be restricted to its own part of the gravitational wave spectrum. You're not going to have two merging black holes of any mass that are going to give you simultaneously different gravitational wave signals. It's just a continuous way of generating these gravitational wave signals. And in part, that's just because gravity is a much dumber force than electromagnetism. I mean, there's not positive and negative gravitational charges. It's just lumps of matter and energy and they're doing something at a certain frequency and that's where they're going to radiate nothing complicated about it exactly yeah okay and so although i object to calling it dumb i feel like you're hurting the black hole's feelings (laughs) so if someone's going to speak up on their behalf i will (laughs) it's straightforward let's say that it's there's not a lot of uh, cancellation of subtle effects but Mm -hmm. for the neutron star neutron star mergers so how many of those have we found one only one okay yeah that's just one. Special. Yeah. It's very special. Um, but there you get both gravitational waves and an explosion that is very visible in light. Yes, that's, that's right. That's why we can tell that the speed of them coming to us is the same. That's right. And we've been able to monitor the remnant afterwards oh, to okay. see like how the light is evolving, to see what materials were produced when the two neutron stars merged. In fact, I think it was on the front page of the Wall Street Journal because it would have <laughs> created vast amounts of gold and platinum if you could. Yeah. Speculators go wild. <laughs> travel but, out yeah, there. They exactly. Can't get it. Yeah. Okay. Good. So we so general relativity once again pretty good shape. Yes, it's in yes. very good shape. Okay. Good. Buy my book. I wrote a book about it. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I did. So good. Very good. That's one. Uh, so sorry, we have LIGO, we yeah. now understand LISA is going to happen in the future. And yeah. LISA, what is the main target for LISA going to be? LISA will look at uh, intermediate mass black holes and supermassive black hole mergers. And um, it'll also look at things called extreme mass ratio in spirals or MREs. And that means that the ratio of the two masses will be something like 1,000 or 10,000 to 1. And so a tiny black hole falling into a big black hole. Exactly. And then those create really interesting gravitational wave signatures. Um, so it can look at those. It can look at these intermediate mass black holes. And it can look at supermassive black hole mergers. It's so the, extre- the, point, the point of LISA depends on who you ask. Sure. <laughs> so people like me who study supermassive black holes say, clearly, we want to look for the baby supermassive black holes. The ones that are a million times the mass of the sun because the billion solar mass ones you find with pulsar timing arrays. Right. Okay. So their frequencies are too low to be in yeah. pieces band. Not I only that, I'm... but they don't exist because there's another thing that we haven't spoken about yet. Okay. There's something called the innermost stable circular orbit of a black hole binary system and well of any black hole really, but the same thing holds true for black hole binary systems. And that's just the, the last stable orbit that any kind of body can orbit around, right? And so if you have two merging billion solar mass black holes and say they're roughly uh, the same mass, they will merge at a millionth of a hertz, at 10 to the minus six hertz. And so what that means is that it merges in the space in between pulsar timing and LISA. Uh, so those black okay. holes will never make it to the LISA band. They merge first. So their ISCO frequency for the experts who might be listening is 10 to the minus six Hertz. And so you're right in between experiments. Okay. Well, you know, that's only given human ingenuity, not yet up to the task of 
finding a way to look at that band, mm-hmm. right? But mm-hmm. okay. Mm-hmm. I'm actually a big fan of the uh uh tiny black holes falling into the supermassive ones. Yeah. Because that lets you map out the space-time metric around the big black hole. It's and fabulous. that will really test general relativity. Absolutely. That'd be great. Yes. I look forward to you doing that. I'm a big fan of Lisa for exactly that reason. I think that uh, you know, it was it almost went away. I remember I was on a NASA panel that really pushed for Lisa. But it was decided that it was, you know, a little speculative, the technology we didn't know. And then it wasn't until LIGO found gravitational waves at all. who said, oh, wait, we got to do this now. <laughs> right. Well, there's also the elephant in the room. That's the James Webb Space Telescope that took all the money. I know. But <laughs> Maybe not, it's not polite to talk about that now. No. I mean, but there's I a finite amount of money. It, there is a finite amount of money, but it's not a fixed amount of money. I mean, Congress can decide to pay for two things. <laughs> they true. don't generally, when they cancel one big science project, give the savings to other science projects. Yeah. So I, I, I kind of, I mean, it's true that there are priorities and we have to decide what to do. But it's, I think that scientists often think that their project is fighting against other science projects when it's really usually not the case. You're right. You're right. In that sense, it's not a zero sum game. Not we could always sum. get yeah. more money. So that, that's a really good point. Um, in the case of Lisa, I think that we owe a huge debt of gratitude to the European Space Agency, which then took they on the alive. entire project and kept it alive. And after the LIGO detection, as you mentioned, NASA is now rejoined as a junior partner. Yep. <laughs> that's what you get. <laughs> but, but that's also great because the European Space Agency couldn't afford the full Lisa, so it would have only had two arms. Uh, and now that NASA has rejoined, it's back to full three-armed Lisa. So. All right. Three-armed Lisa. Three-armed Lisa <laughs> in the 2030s, maybe. <laughs> well, but right here and now, so just to finish the retinue here, we have LIGO that has already won the Nobel Prize. Lisa is in the pipeline. But we have your Pulsar timing arrays, which is going right now, right? It's Not only is it going right now, but my colleagues have been timing these millisecond pulsars for decades. Okay. So some of the pulsar timing baselines span almost 30 years. And Nanograv, which is the North American Nanohertz Observatory for Gravitational Waves, um, has been operating um, for the last 15 years, timing these millisecond pulsars in a very um, strategic way to detect gravitational waves. And so as a gravitational wave detector, pulsar timing arrays are also really unique because, you know, we talked about how one pulsar will have an advance or a delay in its arrival time, but the galaxy is full of pulsars, right? And so by using pulsars in this way, you're turning the whole galaxy into a gravitational wave detector, which is really kind of mind blowing, but that is exactly (laughs) what we're doing. And so if you were to see this advance or delay just in one pulsar, you can't really conclude anything because your pulsars are thousands of light years away and there's gas in the galaxy, there's Who dust, right. your you know, wavelengths are affected in different ways by, by these processes. You can have things that scatter. So you have to look for the signal, not only in one pulsar, but in a whole array of pulsars. And so right now, there's about 100 of them that are timed by the International Pulsar Timing Array. So not only Nanograph, but also the European Pulsar Timing Array, the Parks Pulsar Timing Array, and the new Indian Pulsar Timing Array. And so we're collaborating and we're trying to create a new data set which joins together all of our data okay. for these pulsars do, yeah. because your um, sensitivity to detecting gravitational wave scales as the number of pulsars and as the square root of the time. So you should always add more pulsars before sitting and just waiting. (laughs) And the good news is, uh, this is my naivete as a theorist showing through, but you don't need to build anything to do this. You just use existing telescopes, right? Yes, I think that's been a blessing and a curse for pulsar timing arrays because it's such an ingenious idea, which actually had its uh, inception in the early days of of, um, space travel. So uh, Sazen wrote this paper in 1979 describing how you could use the Doppler shifting of signals from potential probes leaving the solar system to look for gravitational waves. Wow. Isn't that, it's so clever, right, that you can use spacecraft and time delays from spacecraft. But then he was very, you know, disappointed that, you know, you don't really have the timing precision that would enable that kind of detection. And then... 
there's a serendipity that happened with pulsar timing as well, that in 1982, the very first millisecond pulsar was discovered. Hmm. And in 1983, there was this paper that came out very early on, like in January, that said, if only we had pulsars that were good enough, we could create a <laughs> pulsar timing array. But unfortunately, none of the pulsars are precise enough. None of them have this kind of, you know, 100 nanosecond timing stability over a decade. Um, but back in the day, in the early 80s, you know, you actually had to read physical journals. And so there's <laughs> <laughs> a little bit of overlap Didn't get where, an email. Yeah, and okay. there's, there's a little footnote in the bottom of that paper saying, you know, like, actually, maybe, maybe it's possible. One. Wow. Yeah. And That's that was in timing. early 1983. Yeah. It's all about timing. But um, back to your comment about this being uh, a cheap experiment, I think it, it has been a blessing and a curse. The idea is beautiful. I think right. it's really an insight. It's a fantastic idea. It's my favorite. It kind of, it still <laughs> thrills me to this day to think that like one of us very clever apes thought about doing that. Yeah. Um, it's also a curse in the sense that it is very cheap. And I think that that makes people take it less seriously. I think that if, you know, uh, the National Science Foundation had invested billions of dollars in this experiment over the last few decades, that it would have a much higher profile than it does right now. Um, of course, that kind of investment also enables lots of public outreach and a huge machine behind the experiment. Um, but in fact, in the last um, few years, the National Science Foundation has invested heavily in Nanograv. And so we received a Physics Frontier Center award for $15 million um, about six or seven years ago was the first one. And it was just renewed uh, two years ago for $17 million. And so this is the biggest investment uh, in right. pulsar timing arrays directly on the planet. So we are very grateful uh, for, you know, this money to enable the experiment and um, you know, to pay for students and postdocs and researchers and telescope time. But LIGO was a billion dollars. But LIGO was at least a billion dollars. Yeah. And and so, yeah, I think that there's this kind of interesting psychology, mm -hmm. right, that happens when you have an investment that's that big in something. And there was at least a chance 10 years ago that you would have found gravitational waves before LIGO. Oh, it was a neck and neck contest, we thought. And in fact, <laughs> there's another funny story about that. So in 2015, people, you know, in September 2015, there was the very first gravitational wave event. And of course, scientists get very excited. <laughs> and so people accidentally leave uh, preprints on a printer. Sure. Paper drafts are lying all over the place. And people are, of course, just calling their friends and telling them, unless you're Kip Thorne, who didn't tell his wife. Look, <laughs> <which laughs> well, he lived a long time just to make this <laughs> moment happen. He was not going to ruin it with loose lips at the end. Yeah. Exactly. Exactly. But everyone else is very excited. And like I heard about it at the Red Door. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> the so, cafe at Caltech. Yeah. Exactly. Uh, when I was a postdoc there, at the same time, there was a signal in the nanograv 11-year data that looked a hell of a lot like a gravitational wave background signal. So I haven't told you yet what a gravitational wave background is, but if we just go with the fact that there was a signal in the data and it was basically a race against when does LIGO see the first binary black hole merger and when, does, uh, when do pulsar timing arrays or nanograv see the this random gravitational wave background no one knew what the answer was because right. no one know what nature did like yeah. no one knows how many merging supermassive black holes there are what the amplitude of the background is and no one knows what the merger rates are for real of binary black holes i mean before the first lego detection this varied by orders of magnitude every year you would get new papers that had different wild estimates so people just kind of threw their hands up in the air and they're like the merger rate is whatever you think it is like we <laughs> Who so, knows? But it ended up LIGO was pretty lucky with a bunch of black hole mergers. LIGO was so lucky. So it's LIGO in terms of these ground-based experiments, but we should also be careful. There was also there's the Virgo detector in Italy, um, and that helps with triangulation when you can see there's there's mm -hmm. two LIGO detectors in the U.S. There's one in Italy, and there's also one in Japan called CAGRA. Um, CAGRA is cool because it has sapphire mirrors. <laughs> <laughs> okay, that is cool. I got it. It's cool. Yeah. <laughs> doesn't look like a sapphire like you can't put a ring on it but <laughs> it is very cool yeah um 
but yeah, LIGO got really lucky with the first detection because it was screaming loud. And I did uh, some of my PhD work on LIGO. And I know for a fact that people have been working for many, many years on creating very sensitive data analysis pipelines to tease out the hint of a gravitational wave signal and have very sophisticated Bayesian analysis techniques to look for the evidence in every sense of the word mm -hmm. <laughs> for this signal. And the first one was so loud you could see it by eye <laughs> and no one would believe it. They yeah. were like, did someone shake the mirror? Like right. guys for yeah. real, did someone just put this in where we hacked? <laughs> like what, what happened? And uh, it was just a screaming loud gravitational wave signal. So at that time, there was also a signal in the nanograv 11 year data. This is the pulsar timing. This array. is the pulsar timing array. And we were like, oh my gosh. I'll make it there first. Um, are we going to scoop LIGO? <laughs> Which would be so fun in the sense that, uh, you know, our little experiment that had, you know, very limited funding was now competing. It was like a David and Goliath right. kind of situation. And so internally we were like, mm, maybe we should have a joint press conference <laughs> <laughs> imagining like yeah. what we're going to do with pulsar timing arrays. And, um, and then LIGO starts kind of slinging mud in a collegial way, of course, but like saying like, it's not a direct detection. Like you're not making anything that's direct. We have a waveform and we're like, <laughs> that's not super true. Like we're looking at the change in times of pulsars and you're looking at the change in distance and signals. And we know that, you know, GR is right. So yeah. that's the same thing. <laughs> <laughs> you do not have a more direct detector. So anyhow, there was a lot of weird kind of backroom conversations, but in the end, this 11 year signal, um, was likely due to solar system ephemeris errors because 11 years is roughly the period of Jupiter. Oh, I was going to say it was a sunspot cycle, but no, it's because uh, you don't care about sunspots because it's gravitational waves, but you do care about your location in the solar system. You do care about your location in the solar system. And that's because, you know, if you think about where, like how you're timing pulsars, the earth is moving throughout the solar system throughout the year, the pulsars are moving on the sky. So you want to take your time of arrival stamps for your pulsars and transform them to the solar system barycenter. The barycenter is where you can balance the solar system on the tip of your finger, right. right? That's the point you want all of your time of arrivals or your TOAs to be at that point. You can trust everything at that point. If there's a mistake in how you calculate that point, um, what happens is that your pulsar arrival times will circulate the kind of like orbit the true barycenter and create this signal that's present in all of your pulsars, but it won't have the gravitational wave shape to it that we expect, it, it's a, which is a quadrupole. It'll have a dipole signature, but not the quadrupole. So that's good. It's sort of a check that you haven't yes. messed up. Unless there is so much dipole signal that it leaks <laughs> into the quadrupole right. in your data analysis. And that's actually what we found. Okay. Um, we found that there was this you know, it could be something like eccentricity. There was some sort of error in the position and mass of Jupiter that was perturbing the solar system barycenter. And once um, my colleague at JPL, Michele Velisneri, wrote this software to correct for this, the signal went away. Okay. So has Nanograv detected something? Have they announced the detection? You don't have to tell us any secrets. But, I mean, publicly, have pulsar timing arrays found any gravitational waves yet? So publicly, there uh, is a lot of excitement about the last round of papers that have come out from Nanograv, from the European Pulsar Timing Array, and from the Parks Pulsar Timing Array, and then together from the International Pulsar Timing Array. Everyone has found a signal that has an amplitude that would signify that it comes from a gravitational wave background, right? The amplitude is commensurate with what we would expect theoretically to come from the cosmic merger history of supermassive black holes. So maybe I should take a second to just dig into that. So if you have you know, one source emitting gravitational waves, you can detect that one source on the sky. But now imagine you have galaxy mergers that are happening all over the place. Yeah. And then they are not only happening all over the place, but they've been happening for a long time. So you now get a buildup of signals in, your, in each one of the frequency bins that you're sensitive to. 
And so this creates a stochastic or random gravitational wave background. So you not only have one signal, but you have potentially tens of thousands of signals. So you don't measure just one merging supermassive black hole, but you measure the amplitude of all of this um, gravitational wave signal that's interfering with itself, for lack so, of a better so word. So just to be clear, we have the cosmic microwave background, which are photons, and they literally were all bumping into each other and bumping into atoms, and, and it's all over the place. This is totally different. Totally different. And it's it. you call it a background just because it's coming from many individual sources that are sort of like, as far as our detectors are concerned, it's one big smush on the sky. That's right. Um, but if we want to get technical, it is a foreground. It is the signal that we're looking for. But someone 30 years ago called it a background, <laughs> and we've been calling it that Fair ever enough. since. Yeah. But for anyone that studies these <laughs> things, you are right. Yes, it is a foreground. And they're they're from supermassive black hole mergers? What, what kind of mergers are we talking about? Yes. Yeah, so if the sources are astrophysical, then yes, it would come from supermassive black hole mergers. However, people are very creative. And it's possible that there's also gravitational waves from inflation. Um, so In we call those... Universe. Exactly. Primordial gravitational waves, which could either be part of the signal or the whole signal. If it were the whole signal, then we would be in a very strange universe where we would have a big bounce and mm -hmm. a big a big crunch. Um, thought, I'm, I know that you know all about this, Sean, <laughs> but you would be in a kind of uh, ekparotic right. style universe. Um, and crazier things like cosmic strings would give you gravitational waves. And cosmic strings also give you gravitational waves and a gravitational wave background. And so, in fact, what we have right now is that there's this amplitude of a gravitational wave background that we found. But right now, the way that you distinguish between what's generating the background is how that amplitude evolves as a function of frequency. So as you go to higher and higher frequencies, how does that amplitude vary? And right now, we don't have enough measurements in different frequency bins to say exactly how that signal is evolving. So we can't say for sure that that signal would be from supermassive black hole binaries that would have a very uh, finite, like F to the minus two thirds dependence. The problem is that a primordial background would be minus one and cosmic strings would be like minus seven eighths. Supermassive black holes is minus two thirds. So everything is about yeah, minus similar. one. <laughs> everything is about minus one. So, so it's not like LIGO where there was a big press conference that I was at, you know, they, they announced the thing. It's something where it's going to creep up on us. There's already been papers saying maybe we're beginning to see the hints of this. Yeah. So right now we think that it's a hint potentially of a gravitational wave background signal because there's two parts to a detection with pulsar timing. So the first part is this amplitude. You see the same amplitude in all the pulsars that you're timing. That rules out anything else that could possibly be talking to all of these pulsars in the galaxy at the same time. Right. There's nothing else, right? <laughs> they have different noises, and so we, we cross-correlate all of the pulsars in our array because as you do this cross-correlation, anything that's not common and the pulsars falls away, and only the common signal is left afterwards. And so this cross-correlation is important for two reasons. You get what this amplitude is of the gravitational wave background. And as you said correctly, this is something that builds up very slowly as a function of time. Mm. And so we call this red noise. So what we technically right now call the signal that we found is a common red noise process. And that just means that it is a low frequency signal that's in all of the pulsars. We're not sure what it is, it looks promising. But it's it the could right, be something other than what But it could imagine. be something else, right. right? We have to be very careful. Now, the second thing that you get from doing this cross-correlation search um, is this correlation function. It's kind of a two-point correlation function. So basically, when you correlate any two pulsar pairs, general relativity tells you what this expected correlation function value is for any given pulsar pair. You have to explain what a correlation function is. Yeah. So if I have pulsars that are separated by a certain angle on the sky, um, they can have uh, 
say, let's just start with a positive and negative correlation. So if the pulsars are positively correlated, it's like doing, you know, a fist bump in the air with both of your hands at the same time. You go up and down, they are positively correlated. You expect those pulsar signals to be, you know, positively right. correlated. When you're seeing one, you'll expect to see the other. Yeah, you see them both moving at the same time. So they're positively correlated. But if your pulsars are separated by something like 80 degrees, then they're going to be anti-correlated. So one is coming kind of closer to you. The other one is moving away. Um, but it's a negative or an anti-correlation. Because of this plus or cross polarization. If you're stretching space time in one direction, you're squeezing it in the other. That's right. It's not, it's that, but integrated over the whole sky. Yeah. And so that, which we call spatial correlations, that has not been found by anyone yet. And that's going to be the smoking gun. And after we find that, that's when we'll have a big press release and make a huge, you know, guffaw about everything. Okay, very good. Yes. But right now we have one piece of the puzzle, which is this amplitude, um, which is the same in all the pulsars. And in fact, now we have... Um, as I explained a little bit earlier, this signal that comes from nanograv, but also the Europeans found the same signal and the Australians found the same signal. And we do not use the same telescopes. We do time some of the same pulsars in the Northern Hemisphere. So there is some overlap between Europe mm -hmm. and nanograv. But in the Southern Hemisphere, it's very difficult for anyone in the Northern Hemisphere to time those pulsars. So it's curious that we found a consistent amplitude uh, and it's also curious as to what that tells us. If it does come from supermassive black holes, it means that the final parsec problem that we talked about doesn't exist. That none sense? of them, none of them stalled. None of the black holes got hung up. They all managed to merge very fluidly Somehow, because yeah. if they, if there is a hang up, if they do stall, then this decreases the amplitude of the gravitation wave background by about 30%. And so the only way to get two black holes to, that have stalled to eventually merge in the absence of anything else is to realize, you know, we believe that in the universe we have these hierarchical galaxy mergers. Eventually a third galaxy is going to show up with its own supermassive black hole. You're going to have this three-body interaction and the least massive black hole. Yes, the least massive. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Wait, yes, gets ejected from the system and the remaining two merge. So they always merge. It sometimes would just take them a very long time to merge. And so if there is that kind of stalling or if there's not enough stars, if there's not enough gas, that decreases the amplitude of the background by about 30%. But if for what we're seeing right now really is from supermassive black holes, it's completely inconsistent with, with any kind of stalling. So okay. the universe finds a way to make supermassive black holes merge on a very reasonable time scale. In fact, it's so reasonable that this signal was first seen in the International Pulsar Timing Array data three years ago, maybe four years ago now. And we were like, that can't be right. <laughs> <laughs> this has got to be something in like the telescope back ends. There's something weird happening here. It could be. I mean, this is not crazy talk, right? Exactly. No, it's not. But we were just like, we just were not ready to admit yeah. that like what we're seeing was potentially this signal because it was so loud. So we were, you know, and, and people in my field have been writing papers for years about like why we haven't seen the gravitational wave background yet. Like, is it because they're <laughs> stalling? Is it because right. supermassive black hole masses have all been overestimated? Are they not so massive? And on and on and on. And, you know, I've, that's why I got interested in this whole problem in the first place is like, why haven't we seen anything yet? It was there potentially, yeah. Yeah. but maybe not. But <laughs> what we really need to do is find those spatial correlations um, that come from our correlation function that we use. So a lot of fields of science use these correlation functions. Sure. Um, and you have a prediction for what the value should be. You measure what it actually is. And so just to you know take a step back, because this is, this is very, um, it's fascinating stuff. And like you, like you very accurately conveyed it is a triumph of human ingenuity to figure this out it's like almost like we have a spider web spread throughout 
the near regions of our galaxies connecting us to these pulsars and we're feeling the vibrations, right? That's how I had Ed Young on the podcast recently. He was talking about all the different ways that different animals sense the world and yeah. spiders feel vibrations in their webs. Yes. And it, it just reminds me of that. Like we're feeling the vibrations in I'm, the web of pulsars. Exactly. And the wavelengths of gravitational waves that are doing what we care about are tens of light years. So, you know, Visible light is very tiny wavelength. <laughs> Microwaves are a centimeter or whatever. And this is tens of light years wavelength. And we might be able to be detecting. We might be able, we might be detecting it already. That's right. That's right. And that's why it takes so long to make one of those detections because you have to, for an individual source, wait for, you know, one wave cycle to go by. And for the gravitational wave background, what you do is that you get more and more sensitive to the background. Um, as the number of pulsars you include in your array, and then as the square root of the time. So you can try to add more pulsars, but you're not guaranteed that if you get telescope time and point it at the sky, that you're gonna find the pulsars that you need. Right. So then you just keep timing the pulsars that you have, and you also keep trying to find new ones. But then, um, because you need such long time spans to get to very low sensitivities, because you're the bucket of your experiment or the lowest frequency that you're sensitive to is one over your total time. And so mm -hmm. the larger your total time, the lower, the lower the frequency you can get to. And so you want to have very long time spans. You want to have as many pulsars as you can. That's why the international collaboration is so important because you not only increase your time spans, but you increase your number of pulsars and you can also increase, you know, the density of the data points that you have because people have been timing different pulsars at different times. So if you can combine all of that data, you get this denser data stream that's going to be particularly useful for, for finding the individual sources. Well, okay, good. That was my next question because it would be a different thing if all of these waves that we were detecting came from one source, right? Then I presume that then the sort of spatial pattern would be much easier to perceive, but it's sort of a cacophony from all directions, right? Mm -hmm. is, is there hope of eventually disentangling that and saying, okay, here are the locations of the loudest sources? How feasible is it to imagine going from, oh, there's a whole washed out background to, oh, I'm beginning to perceive there's a bright spot in sure. the sky? Sure, yeah, okay. So if you want to detect a gravitational wave background, you do this cross-correlation search and you look for this correlation function that should exist. But if you want to look for individual sources, what you actually do is that you look for, right now, we look for sinusoidal waves in mm -hmm. the individual pulsar timing data. And so we don't look for cross correlations uh, in the pulsar data right now to look for the individual sources. So the individual ones could be relatively nearby. Um, there's been a lot of research done to try to understand if we're gonna detect like a single source first or the gravitational wave background first. Almost everyone agrees that it's the gravitation wave background okay. because in the background you have, you know, the cosmic merger history of all of the supermassive black holes. So that's a lot of gravitational wave power that's going into those low frequencies. But if you have one black hole binary system that's relatively nearby, then that will swamp mm, your other noisy. signal. Yeah. So like, which one is it? So it looks like we might... Uh, have seen the first hint of something happening for the background, which means we now have to find a way to subtract it mm. to get so rid of that the... noise so that we can see what's underneath. Right, okay. And what's underneath will be likely either an individual source or it could be an isotropy in the gravitational wave background, similar to the cosmic microwave background, how they have those beautiful maps of hot spots and cold spots you could have something similar for pulsar timing rays yeah. where you have parts of the sky that have more merging supermassive black hole binaries and other parts of the sky. Or maybe there's one that's nearby that's not quite detectable on its own, but might leave a huge blemish in the gravitational wave background by leaving some excess power in that part of the sky. Will we be able to get anything about the epoch of most of these mergers? I mean, with this question of uh, how do the mergers happen? So how are we going to do science to use pulsar timing arrays to help answer that kind of question? Yeah, that's a great question. So when you're computing um, the amplitude of what you expect the gravitational wave background to be, there's 
the two main ingredients are number one, what the black hole mass is, and then number two, what's the number density of supermassive black holes that you have. And so the number density tells you, you know, I have a certain volume, how many supermassive black hole binaries do I have in that volume? And so that's a number that you can play with. And as you go out further and further and further, you'll have more and more and more supermassive black holes. And so given the fact that when you try to theoretically estimate the amplitude of the background, you have those two big ingredients. When you actually detect the gravitational wave background, you can try to tease out mm. those two quantities. So what's the minimum black hole mass that's contributing to the gravitational wave background? And what's the number density of these as a function of distance uh, or redshift in the universe? It goes very quickly from you discovered something new and completely unanticipated or at least uh, unprecedented, I should say, to this is an everyday tool we're going to use to understand the universe better, right? <laughs> yeah, exactly. I think unanticipated is not quite right, as in it's been right. anticipated for 15 years at least. It's been it's been so long. In fact, the first paper was written um, on using this cross-correlation cross -correlation search in 1983. So it's, okay. it's been a yeah. while. Yeah. So do you, closing thought, do you yeah. recommend that uh, young people who are interested in uh, the frontier of astrophysics think about this kind of thing as something to learn more about? So young people interested in the frontiers of astrophysics should do what, whatever they think is the coolest <laughs> thing that they can think of. Yeah. And for me, when I was a kid, it was black holes. And I started working on the LIGO experiment when I was a graduate student, and then I um, thought that maybe pulsar timing arrays were a place where I could make more of a mark because it felt like LIGO was already very saturated. Sure. It was a very mature field. And I was like, this is a bit of a gamble, but like, what if I can make yeah. some sort of big contribution to this new field? Um, so I've, I've been doing it before it was cool, Sean. Oh yeah. No, but now <laughs> it's extremely cool. And now it's extremely cool. So I, I think, you know, but the only reason that you can ever make it through a PhD is if you really love what it is that you're working on. And so my advice would to just be like, find the coolest thing you can think of and do that thing. Cannot think of a better place to end than that. Chiara Mingarelli, thanks so much for being on the Mindscape Podcast. Thanks, Sean. It's a pleasure.